we are going to start at the beginning uh, with meshing and discretizations. As Laurie said, this, uh, this year we're focusing on unstructured meshing and discretization. So we're talking about problems where structured meshes are not sufficient to represent the geometry, to represent the complex physics. So we're looking at meshes that are unstructured, very general. And my talk is going to be focused on the discretization part of it. Mark is going to talk more about meshing. I will also touch upon that a little bit. When I talk to about discretizations, I will focus on finite element methods. Uh, these methods are really good. They, they offer a lot of uh, flexibility and foundation uh, for the next generation simulation capabilities that we're interested in, in particular when it comes to um, problems that have different variety of physics coming together. So those are the multi-physics problems that Laurie mentioned. They allow you to discretize PDEs on very general grids, uh, grids that are potentially curved, very unstructured, have local features like adaptive mesh refinement like this one. And in addition to the mathematical robustness, the, 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 pr the practical flexibility of finite elements, when you add higher order on top of that, then you get a lot of um, additional capabilities that are very relevant to the large scale supercomputers that we're getting today and the ones that we will be getting in the future. So my focus really will be on how are the finite elements, on general, how are the curvilinear grids. These are very well known to be beneficial when you have problems with smooth solutions. Uh, they give you the best bang for your buck, uh, the best accuracy per degree of freedom. But we've also shown that they're beneficial for problems where you have discontinuities, like problems with shocks. And here's just one example. This is a compressible flow simulation. And I don't know if you can see this, but uh, basically from here, all the way up to here, this is one computational element for the eight. And there are other elements here that allow you to very naturally follow the flow in the simulation. And in this type of simulation, they're called Lagrangian simulations. You can really push them much further than you can, for example, when the geometry is lowered. They don't own, the how the finite elements not only give you mathematical benefits and better simulations, they also have a lot of advantages in terms of performance. And in terms of future architectures, David already mentioned that they allow you to dial up the flops to bytes ratio, the arithmetic intensity. The order is, you can think of it as a performance tuning parameter. And as you increase the order, you can basically dial this up to infinity. Okay? I want to mention that um, when you apply them to multi-physics problems, one of the really nice things that finite elements bring in is a very natural connection between the natural spaces for um, the different, the, the spaces where you want to discretize different physics. So for example, kinematics you usually discretize in this space H1, which has, uh, which represents continuous functions associated typically with the nodes, the vertices of the mesh. If you're solving electromagnetic problems, uh, MHD, you usually use this H cross space for the electric field. Radiation diffusion problem in flux formulation uses H diff. And then thermodynamic things like density, energy, pressure, usually is discontinuously um, discretized in L2. This is also where all these continuous Galorkian methods live. And with finite elements, you have the connection between these spaces with this differential operator that you can bring from the continuous level, it's called the drum complex, all the way down to fully discrete level and exploit it in your simulation. Now, one, one challenge with finite elements is that they're relatively complicated. Uh, you can certainly uh, write a finite element code yourself, and I'll encourage you to do that. But when you want to use them uh, at large scale, when you want to use advanced features, uh, finite elements are one topic where it really pays off to use a library. There are many finite element libraries developed. The one that I want to talk about is the one we've developed in Livermore, and uh, that's the MFM finite element library. The goal for MFM is to allow application scientists to quickly develop applications built on top of it. We take care of the discretization. You can just focus on the physics. It also allows uh, computational mathematicians to perform research on how the finite elements and then in general finite element uh, meshing algorithms. Uh, and all of this uh, at great generality but without any sacri uh, sacrificing of performance. Okay, the generality is, for example, we support any type of mesh, triangular, quadrilateral, hexahedral, tetrahedral, volume meshes, surface meshes. We support arbitrary order meshes, arbitrary order spaces on top of these meshes for the whole DRAM complex. Exactly, there's a question. Yes. Uh, do you support pyramids? Uh, they're coming, yes. We also support pyramids and prisms, they're coming. 
but, but not currently in the master branch. Yes. Uh, we also support, uh, for both of these, both on simplex and tensor product geometries, we support uh, adaptive mesh refinement. I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit. We also support NURBS, uh, a wide variety of finite element methods on top of this, not just Galorkin and discontinuous Galorkin, but also DPG, IGA. Yes? Can you just uh, define high order mesh? Is that just referring to the side, to the, the boundaries being? So here's an example. So here's an example. How are the meshes are described, not just by their vertices, but by a lattice of points. So this is a first order mesh. It, if you think of the um, blue dots here representing the nodes. Uh, the nodes here and vertices are the same, so you just have straight lines. When you introduce second order mesh, uh, you have additional degrees of freedom at the edge, uh, at the middle of the edges in the center, so the, the element now curves, and this is a third order mesh, okay? So the order just refers to the polynomial that describes the boundaries? And the interior. It des describes the mapping from reference element to the physical space. Daniel, can I just jump in? These are the Texas guys giving you a hard time. Um, <laughs> but just to answer your question, you, uh, you might want to look in more detail at the seed project and some new work that's being done on the interfaces there. Because in terms of how you might want to define your mesh in terms of geometry and everything, you'll be supporting from Bayes and, and through everything else. Right, so, so Mark is referring to, to the FM as the uh, field and mesh specification format that we have. But basically the idea is the mapping from a reference element to physical element now is a higher order polynomial in each component. Okay, all right. All right, let me see if I can go through this. <laughs> uh, all right, um, uh, another, another strength of using a library is that it's integrated in many other, with many other libraries. And we're basically integrated with all the libraries uh, that you're gonna hear from today pretty much all the projects as well as other projects. We are also part of um, the ECP. Uh, Mark mentioned the Seed Co-Design Center. That's, we're a major partner there. As well as FastMath, XSDK, OpenHPC, and, and many others. And we have our own little visualization tool called Chilvis that I'm gonna demo today. Okay, so just to give you a flavor of what it looks like to implement uh, to use finite elements uh, in MFAM to implement a simple equation. I'm gonna go through the first example of the code. Okay, you started with a mesh. The foundation of everything is a computational mesh. Uh, don't try to read this yet. I'm just trying to give you an overview and then we're gonna dive in. On top of the mesh, you define a finite dimensional approximation space. That's your finite element space where you're gonna approximate the physical quantities of interest as discrete functions. Then you define your initial guess, could be zero for example, or something else if you have a time dependent simulation, and the linear and bilinear form. Uh, in functional analysis speak, this is just, this is just uh, the way we describe uh, left-hand side and right-hand side. Okay, you turn this PD continuous level problem into a linear algebra problem. Okay, that's what MFM does for you, and then you do a linear solve, and then you visualize it. Uh, you turn it back into a finite element function, and this, you, you, you can do this with about 200 lines of code. The serial version of FM has no dependency. You can download it, build it in a matter of five minutes, and it's a general code. It works for any order, any mesh, 2D, 3D, uh, and uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to do some simple things. He's diving in the code a little bit more. It takes about three lines to define the mesh. There's nothing special here. This is a refinement. The finite element space is defined based on the mesh and this description of the space that we call collection, where you specify the order and the dimension of the space. Okay, so the order could be anything, the dimension 2D, 3D, 1D. Okay, these are the linear by linear form and, and uh, the initial guess. The linear form, the important thing is basically this coefficient which says that the right hand side in this problem is one. The bilinear form uses this diffusion integrator which tells you it's a grad-grad term. This is the weak form of the Laplacian. This is how we handle boundary conditions. And grid function is, it, this, this is the members of the finite element space. Okay, so this is the discrete function that will approximate the solution. In this case, it just uh, initialized to zero. This is how we turn uh, by um, assembly elimination of boundary condition and this call, we turn the bilinear form into a matrix. And then we just use preconditioned conjugate gradient with a simple smoother to solve that problem. This is a serial example again, nothing fancy. Uh, and this is how you send the solution for visualization. It's basically just a C++ stream 
Uh, in this particular case, we use socket, so this connection goes over the network. Okay, so this was example one, serial, nothing, um, um, pretty simple stuff. Uh, but one of the advantages of MFM is that you can experiment and prototype uh, at that level, and then you, with just a few lines of code changes, you can turn that serial example into highly performant, scalable parallel example. Okay, so let me go now over the parallel version of that example and highlight the differences. One difference is that you need to introduce a parallel mesh. Okay, and that means that you take your serial mesh, split it, and then refine it some more. We'll talk about splitting uh, uh, load balancing uh, uh, more later. Then you also have to parallelize your finite element space. And a big part of that is identifying what are the shared degrees of freedom between different processors. The way we do that in MFAM is through an interpolation operator called P that tells us from the unique degrees of freedom what are the degrees of freedom on each processor that are, and how, how should we interpret them. Uh, the initial guess linear by linear form, these are just some code decorations really. Uh, and once you, um, you have your local, once you've defined this parallel mesh and parallel finite element space, you just assemble locally and you tie them together with this interpolation operator for variational restriction. I'm gonna go into more details in a second. In this case, this is a great place to use algebraic multigrid from Hyper. You have a global parallel system and you just give it to Hyper. Hyper is very scalable. And so, and then you can visualize it in a similar way. Each processor sends its piece of the data. The data is combined and you, and you can see the different pieces here of different processors can be pulled together, can be pulled apart. And this is maybe um, about 30, 40 lines of additional code and uh, just a few changes to change finite element space to par finite element space or something like that. Yes? Do you have a geometric multigrid? No. Yes? Uh, is there support for complex arithmetic? Complex arithmetic? Not, not, not directly, but we have used it for complex problems indirectly through the two by two real uh, reformulation. Yeah. We've used it for fusion, for example, and all sorts of other Maxwell problems. All right, I just wanted to highlight all the different, so these are all the main differences on one slide. Basically, this is a definition of the parallel mesh from the serial mesh, and then we do parallel refinement. The finite element space, as I said, is just code decoration. It becomes par finite element space, par linear form. This is where you define the high, this is where you go from the bilinear linear forms to the linear algebra world with the hyper matrices and vectors. Calling the AMG, Boomer AMG solver from hyper in MFM is one line of code. Uh, and this is the, the, the part of visualization. Okay, so this was example one, pretty simple stuff. Uh, but we, at this point we have about 19 examples as well as many mini apps, and those cover a wide variety of physics, uh, and they intended to be like uh, initial guess for all of you that are interested in developing your own applications. You can, for many practical purposes, you can probably find an example that is similar to what you wanna do and start from it and, and build on top of it. Okay, and you can see all those examples. We have a, a really nice forum on, on our website, MFMORG, slash examples. All right, so at this point, I would like to do a little demo and uh, go over the lesson. The lesson is called MFM Convergence. Now, while you're setting this up, I'm gonna uh, uh, do a little demo to show you some of the things that I just showed. Okay, so if you go on the MFM website, mfm.org, the examples are listed here, and you can search them and uh, filter them in different ways, but let me just go quickly. The first one is just what I showed, solving the Laplacian equation. Um, the second one solves linear elasticity. Then you go up the Durham complex, uh, definite Maxwell problem, H curl, uh, grad diff problem, H diff problem, Darcy flow, a system. Uh, then, then we're going into things like adaptive mesh refinement. This is example six. Solving on surfaces, PDs on surfaces, example seven. Discontinuous petrov and this is a more advanced, interesting finite element discretization that uses interfacial unknowns. Discontinuous Galorkin methods, we have quite a few of them. So advection uh, is example nine. Nonlinear elasticity, this is a beam problem where you have a um, new Cookian model for the elastic beam. We have several examples on eigenproblems, Laplace, elasticity, and Maxwell. All of these examples, by the way, have serial and parallel versions, and the parallel versions use highly scalable uh, solvers and preconditionals. Digit diffusion, uh, this is an example, 15 is a dynamic MR where uh, the um, 
the mesh changes, refines, and derefines uh, in time. Time dependent heat conduction, this is the generalization of the simple 1D problem that we saw. And in fact, it's even nonlinear. You can take the nonlinear part off, but it's basically solving the, the heat equation in any dimension. Linear elasticity with DG, Euler with DG, and incompressible nonlinear elasticity. Those are the main examples. We also have some mini apps that have much more physics, several on electrostatics, magnetostatics, and Maxwell problems. Uh, and then we have some mini apps that have to do with meshing, um, defining, for example, interesting surfaces like Mobius strip or clam uh, The shape of mini app, I want to say a little bit about this, this. This allows you to refine interfaces, and it's a simple way, for example, to define your own mesh, a simple mesh generator. I'll, I'll show you how this works. Uh, and then there, there are other tools that have to do with examining meshes, optimizing meshes, um, and, and this is one of our um, flagship mini apps, Lagos. All right, so um, if you want to look at the code, I would recommend that you do that on GitHub. Um, you can go to our GitHub page, and this is, for example, um, example one is the definition of the mesh. This is the finite element space. This is the linear and bilinear forms here, the solve, and here's the visualization. Okay, and let me just show you real quick how this works. Go on the hands-on lesson, convergence. Um, there's a directory called MFM examples. And I'm gonna start GeoVis as a server here. This is my local laptop. Okay, so if I run example one, okay, so this was the serial code. We just solved it. This is what we solved. It's just a plus problem on this mesh. Zero boundary conditions. And this is the, the, this is the membrane problem. The membrane is fixed, so you expect to see a hump-like shape. Uh, okay, so let, let me run the parallel version of this example now, okay? Uh, all right, so this is much more nonce. Uh, I run it on 16 cores. And I guess I'm not the only one. Okay, so this, this data here that you saw was actually from AMG, and Ulrike is gonna talk about uh, AMG later. This is the AMG convergence. As you can see, uh, it'll take much less iterations than before. And the 16 processors that are running right now we will each compute their own solution, but it's all synchronized. <coughs> Uh, and it's put together here in GeoVis. Okay. The mesh is much finer, and here are the actual subdomains, each processor solve independently here, okay? But if you look at the overall solution, it's continuous. It, the, 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 the MFM, uh, for this interpolation operator, combined everything and synchronized the cores. This was, uh, I just showed you this 2D problems, but this equally well works in 3D, and let me just for fun run a tetrahedral mesh to show you that we can do those. This is called, this is called Asher. It's an interesting polyhedron. Again, we solve it with AMG again, 16 cores. Okay, and so this is the mesh. And these are the pieces and the different processors. And in this case, if you wanna see, the solution is zero on the boundary, so on the outside there is nothing interesting, but if you look inside, you can see it's kind of the hump is in the center, so you can see the continuous solution. Okay. All right, so with that, let's move to the, let's move to the demo now, uh, to the, to the hands-on lesson. Uh, and this is a very simple lesson that is just an introduction to finite elements. If you're familiar with finite elements, feel free to go ahead and look at the other examples or do something more productive. Um, the intention here is to just show you how you, um, uh, what's the influence of the mesh size and the order on the convergence rate. Uh, when it discretizes a simple problem like this Laplace problem. Okay, there is a, this answer form that um, 
we expect you to, during the day, uh, to submit answers. Uh, when we have questions, you may want to open this up. Uh, and as I said, go into the FM convergence directory. So this is one app from where I was here, or two apps, sorry. And you will see a convergence example. Okay. All right. So uh, we're solving the Laplace equation. It's a continuous equation at a continuous level that has infinitely many unknowns. So finite elements allow you to take this infinite information and discretize it, represent it with just finite number of unknowns. And the way we do that is by introducing a finite element space, the space of finite dimension, with, where the basis is this basis functions phi i, and each function is represented by a, as a linear combination of these functions. Okay? These basis functions are defined for a mesh. So the first thing you do is you discretize your domain. You represent your domain uh, as a finite number of little elements, in this case, little quadrilaterals. And the basis functions, uh, for example, could be one in one of the vertices and zero everywhere else. So this is what's shown here. It's called the hat basis functions. So they're associated in this case, for this particular problem, they're associated with the vertices and the number of unknowns is the number of vertices. More generally, for other members of the Durham complex, they, be, they can be associated with faces, edges, the interior of the element. There could be many of them. Uh, and they could have a more uh, interesting shape. They could be higher order polynomials, for example, not just these linear functions. Okay. And they can also be on, defined on a much, much more interesting mesh. Since we define one element at a time, it doesn't really matter what the connectivity of the mesh is. We can handle mesh like this. Okay, so once you have this finite element space, the, the finite dimensional representation of your solution, you plug it in the equation, uh, and then you multiply it with another basis function, and in this case, we use the Galerkin formulation, so the same test and trial space, and then you integrate by parts. And this is what you get. This is the divergence theorem here. Uh, this is called the weak form, the weak variational form. This is what finite elements solve. It's much more natural for them. And this weak variational form, MFM and other finite element libraries will translate to linear algebra. They will, they will translate it to this linear system AX equals B by introducing something called the stiffness matrix, which is just this integral of the basis functions, and load vector, which is just this right-hand side. And the unknowns here are these coefficients in front of your basis functions. Okay, now this is usually a very large sparse but very ill-conditioned linear system, and so you can solve it directly or iteratively, and we're gonna show examples of both of those. And the convergence example that is in the MFM convergence directory in the hands-on allows you to do that um, on a variety, on a sequence of meshes, of um, uh, um, varying mesh size, as well as uh, with variety of orders uh, for the approximation. Okay, so this is, this is we kind of went over this already, uh, this is the definition of the space, and you will see here that the order matters. And this is the particular bilinear form. This diffusion integrator corresponds to these entries. Linear form. This is the definition of hyper, uh, the hyper preconditioner, and, and how we get the solution back. All right. So we're using here something called the method of manufactured solution. So we pick a continuous solution that... Um, we know, we evaluate the right-hand side, we solve the problem with that, and then we can compare how accurate our finite element approximation is to the continuous solution. Uh, you can measure that error in different norms. Uh, you can use it in the L2 norm, which is just the, um, um, the integral of the square of the differences, or in the H1 norm that includes this additional term uh, with the gradients. Uh, and then a convergence rate is what, how does the error decrease as you refine the mesh, as you take h smaller and smaller. Okay. You can estimate the convergence rate using this simple trick. Uh, if you assume that C does not depend uh, on, uh, depends only on the problem, uh, and um, your error depends on the mesh size in this particular way for some r, then you can recover what r is um, by looking at the solution on two consecutive, uh, looking at the error on two consecutive um, levels. Okay, so here is, uh, Here's how this is actually implemented in MFM. It's just a computation of the auto error and these logarithms. And now let's, let's do some runs. So if we run the default convergent example, 
okay? The R7 here means do seven levels of refinement, okay? So you can see the number of degrees of freedom, the mesh size as it decreases, and the L, L2 and H1 errors and the uh, kind of computed rates using this formula that I just showed. Let me go back. Right, this one. Okay, so if you look at that, you would say, oh, well, so in L2, it seems like we're getting second order convergence, and in H1, we're getting first order convergence. So one order more in L2. All right. Now, this was, the, by default, we run first order. Okay, what if we run higher order? So let's say we run order three. Okay, so the dash O parameter here is you can specify any order. And so it's the same story. You, you refine the mesh, but now on each level you use third order polynomials. And what you see here is that, huh, you get much better convergence. It's fourth order in L2 and third order in H1. And so this is an example of a problem with smooth solution. And as I said in the beginning, this is an example of a problem where high order allows you to get much better error with the same number of degrees of freedom. And so if you look at the results, um, the questions here that we have for you are, well, first of all, how many unknowns do we need in each of these rounds if we want to get about four digits of accuracy? And in terms of the error, which method is more efficient? Am I supposed to answer this question, Sorik? <laughs> <laughs> or should they, should, should they answer them by themselves? All right, so uh, this was this were these two examples. Let's let's run something in 3D, and this will be on a just on a hex mesh. And I'm also going to run this in parallel. Okay, this was second order. And so now we have three points of reference. We run first order, we run third order, and we run second order. Uh, and we kind of know what the L2 and H1 rates that we got are. So in the beginning L2 was two, then four, four order three, then three. So can you make a guess what the L2 and the H1 errors should be in general for an order P? I'm not asking you to prove that, that there is some really nice functional analysis, finite element theory that will allow you to prove that, but can you make a guess what, what it should be? And, and correspondingly what the H1 rate should be? And so that's the that's this question. Okay, so let me let me continue now with how we use. So this was just a, a simple introduction. Yes. Uh, one other question: uh, Does it do P activity also? Sorry, can you say that? Activity. The. So there is no P adaptivity um, except for discontinuous Galorkin right now in the code. Okay. But you, you guys have anisotropic refinements, right? Yes. All right, let me show you how we use this in a, in a big simulation code where many libraries come together. And so this code is called BLAST. Uh, it solves compressible shock aerodynamics equations. And the beauty of this is that BLAST only focuses on that compressible physics. All the discretization actually is provided by MFM. Uh, and MFM itself uses parallel linear algebra and solvers from Hyper. Okay, so there is a separation of concern. You can mix and match things. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of what BLAST the BLAST algorithms are, it's pretty complicated. You can go and look at our papers. Uh, but just, just to give you an idea, uh, what BLAST uses is what's called an arbitrary Lagrangian invariant formulation. You have two phases in that. In the Lagrangian phase, the mesh follows the fluid, so it deforms, and you solve some conservation equations that are given here using Galorkin finite elements. In the remap phase, you're solving essentially an advection equation. You want to improve the mesh, and you want to flow the mesh through your function without changing it. These are the conservation equations that you solve, and here we use discontinuous Galorkin methods, actually in some interesting basis called the Bernstein basis. Okay, so here are some examples of what BLAST can do. Uh, it can do really nice mixing because higher order finite elements allow you to model subzonal uh, physics uh, very easily. This is a relative rel instability, so heavy over light fluid mixing together. Uh, it can it allows you to deform your elements in a purely Lagrangian uh, calculation very easily. You can maybe see how this uh, wave here gets formed and the elements just curve. Uh, and another thing that it allows you to do that is maybe not as appreciated is that it allows you to 
be much more, to represent symmetry much better. And that's important in problems with implosions and, um, um, and, and blast waves like this one. So this, for example, is a spherical blast wave solved on a Cartesian mesh. The mesh is totally not aligned with the field, but the fact that we have subzonal representation allows us to actually capture that symmetry very well. Okay, in addition of, uh, to providing good results, BLAST also scales very well. These are two plots uh, of strong scaling. Strong scaling means using more and more cores to solve the same problem. And we have several curves that correspond to different orders. So this is order two, four, eight, and uh, 16. And what you can see here, this goes up to 130,000 cores on a PGQ machine, very similar to Mira. What you can see is that for high enough order, we basically get perfect scaling all the way down to one element per core. Now, this, this, was, this is what's called pure refinement. We were using higher and higher order on the same mesh. Here is an example where we, as we increase the order, we also coarsen the mesh. So we compare the same number of degrees of freedom, okay? And this is one of our lower order codes here in blue. On, basically, on top of each other, you see the first, second, and fourth order calculation with BLAST. Uh, and the crossover point here is just 256 points. It's not a lot. But the important thing here is that we basically get the same runtime, even though we get better solution, we do more flops, and the reason for that is that the number of memory transfers in all these methods is the same. Okay, so this is an example where you don't see the flops, you only see really the memory transfers. If you try to apply high order beyond second order, really high order, in this type of applications, you, you, you run into some significant challenges. And just to kind of emphasize these challenges, uh, this is maybe a, a bit extreme, I have these two examples. So this is the roulette Taylor instability run on two elements. And this is one of those um, uh, shock triple point interactions run on four elements. Okay, so if you look at, if you wanna be able to go all the way to disorders, uh, uh, so, sorry, this is 12th order element. Uh, if you wanna go to orders like this, you really need to be, to, to deal with the fact that your mesh element may look like this, or like this, and that the function inside that element may behave like this, okay? So we spend a lot of time uh, working on research to make sure that these methods that have this great flexibility are also robust for, for, for real high order. And these are just two examples here. On the left I have uh, a sample of our work on mesh optimization. When you have higher the meshes that are curved like this, you wanna improve the quality. This is important, for example, in the remap phase of BLAST. And here we use this new Cookian uh, model that is very similar to example 10, actually. And this is an example of the advection process that I mentioned. This is very similar to example nine, uh, where we want to change the mesh, but keep the solution the same. And we use this continuous Glorkin for that. We also have spent some time on visualization. If you have these higher the fields and very curved meshes, you want to see your solution correctly, not as a linear uh, mesh and linear field representation. And so GLVIS does that, and you can also use VISIT uh, to visualize higher the meshes and higher the fields with MFAM. Okay, so in the remaining of the talk, what I wanna focus on uh, is our work on adaptive mesh refinement, okay? Uh, and in particular, how we do that at the library level. Uh, at a level that could be used to many different applications that don't have to reinvent the wheel themselves um, regarding AMR. Since we have both simplices and, and, and tens of product elements, we have both local conforming and non-conforming refinement, uh, but I will mostly focus on the non-conforming case. Uh, it is not uh, HP, it is H refinement with a fixed P, but as I said, we do have some work on P refinement uh, for DG. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty high order, it, it's pretty general. It, it, it is any order for any, the, all the spaces in the DRAM complex, 2D, 3D. There's no restriction on how many hanging nodes you can have. We do support anisotropic refinement, de-refinement, balancing, um, in parallel load, load balancing. And I, I'd like to emphasize again, this is independent of the physics. Uh, we, we've had codes that just had to recompile with this new version of MFM and all of a sudden could run on, on meshes like this, for example. And this is an example of the Shaper Mini app that I mentioned earlier. It allows you, if you, have, um, if you have a function that represents different materials, it will refine on the interface. So if you have a picture of Australia, you can generate a mesh with two different materials and now solve a problem on it. Okay, uh, so conforming refinement basically ensures that um, 
uh, it adds additional refinement to assure that faces are shared properly between elements. This is not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the case where you have non-conforming refinement, which is much more natural for, for quads and hexes, where you have these degrees of freedom uh, that are um, hanging nodes that uh, 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 just belong on face on one side. The way we handle um, non-conforming refinement is, again, from the interpolation matrix. On each coarse fine interface, you have a finer presentation on the refined side and a coarser presentation on the non-refined side. And you restrict the fine side to be the same as the coarse one. This is done for a constraint. So for example, here, these red edges, this is an edge curl problem, so degrees of freedom associated with edges. These two edges, E and F, are constrained to be one half of the value at the, at the uh, edge T. Now, things can get more complicated. You can depend on uh, a degree of freedom, like this red guy, for example, depends on this other red guy, which itself is constrained. So in reality, this degree of freedom here will be actually constrained by those three green degrees of freedom. And you can also have high order like here, but in any case, on a coarse fine interface, you have a simple interpolation matrix, a, a matrix just on that face that gives you the slave or constrained degrees of freedom in terms of the masters. Okay. We collect all these matrices together into a global interpolation matrix, we call it P, and just like in parallel uh, assembly, we assemble locally on each element and we use a variational restriction with P to form the global AMR problem. <coughs> okay, so here's how this works in action. Uh, we have a just randomly refined mesh, pretty ugly inside, even more ugly inside. There's some anisotropic refinement as you can see here. And so all we do here is on each element we assemble just as before, all the finite element machinery continues to work. But in addition to that, we have this, this additional operator P. And when we, when we use that P to tie the pieces together and then recover the solution with P of X, we get a solution that is uh, the global solution that is globally continuous. Okay, why adaptive mesh refinement? I think a lot of you are very familiar with that, but basically it allows you to focus the computational effort uh, where you need to. Uh, and this is just an example of a kind of shock-like solution this is with anisotropic refinement. I think it's this 2D problem. We've also run it in 3D. Uh, you have um, uniform refinement in these uh, dashed lines and uh, adaptive mesh refinement in the solid lines. And this is all normalized by degrees of freedom and versus error. And as you can see, adaptive mesh refinement allows you to solve the problem more accurately with the same number of degrees of freedom. But another thing I'd like you to uh, observe is that higher order Gives you, gives you more benefit. So AMR with higher order is even more beneficial. You go from here to here first order, but from here to here second order, and from here to here fourth order, for example. Okay, so this is another example where higher order is beneficial. This is how this works um, uh, in, in, for, for simple blast problem. It's a spherical uh, wave that we want to uh, propagate for a randomly refined mesh. We wanna see if you get any reflections, if you get any imprinting from the mesh. Ideally, this solution should be spherically symmetric. And we've done it in 2D and 3D uh, in parallel. This is a modest number here. But as you can see, the results are really good. So this is on 4,000 cores. And he's, this is how this works dynamically, okay? So this is the same problem, expanding wave. We want to refine where this shock interface is. And we also here do refine where we think the solution is smooth, for example, behind the shock wave. And you can see some derefinement here. You can see some refinement here. Okay, and here on the, on the, what I have on the right, the processor distribution, as you can see, there is some rebalancing happening every time. And for example, there are processors that, that contain, uh, that, that correspond to a large portion of the domain, but they contain just a few elements. So when we do this rebalancing, we use a space filling curve. We all always plus minus one uh, perfect. Yes? So we also do unrefined. I see you do unrefined. Do refinement, yes. Unrefined. Yeah. Oh, yes. 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 Okay. We coarse an elements. All right. So this is how this scales. So this is just the scaling of this unstructured AMR infrastructure. There's no physics here. Okay. If you add physics, you're actually not going to see a lot of this stuff because it will be a local expensive operation. 
Uh, it, it, this is an interesting plot, by the way. I don't know if you've seen this kind of plots before, but this is a combination of string, uh, strong and weak scaling. So weak scaling means just the problem size per core is the same and you just solve uh, more and more cores. So each of this curve is a strong scaling for a particular size. It goes up to 400K, um, about 400K MPI tasks on Vulkan. Uh, but the size is picked in such a way that this dashed curve here correspond to weak scaling, okay? You want strong scaling to be essentially a line uh, and you want weak scaling to be um, a horizontal line. And as you can see, um, this, this scales really well. Uh, I mean, for large enough problems, the, the strong scaling is really nice. Even for the smaller problems, this, this, um, this turning is not that bad. But the weak scaling in all cases is, is pretty much perfect. And as I said, this does not include any physics. This is just constructing the P, forming the system, rebalancing, re uh, mesh refinement, uh, so just the, the AMR infrastructure. So, so far, I told you how great power there is in terms of quality. Uh, but one of the, um, the things, and David touched upon this, is um, they also, they introduce much more, many more connections. So it's, it, you have to be very careful to implement them efficiently. Some of these efficient implementations, by the way, uh, are matrix free. So you also have to rethink some of your algorithms, algorithms that may use matrices like AMG, and, and, and rediscover how to do them uh, uh, with the efficient higher order representation. And so to tackle that um, efficiency uh, aspect of it, especially when it comes to access scale, we have this SEED uh, co-design center in the ECP. This is our website. It's a large project. Uh, it includes Livermore, Argonne, uh, five universities, about 30 researchers. This is some of the people involved. And the focus here is really on um, PDE-based simulations on the structured grids using card and spectral elements. Adaptive mesh refinement in particular is part of that work too. Uh, and in addition to AMFAM, which is one of the main components of it, uh, the other main component is NEC 5000. So that's the, the um, Paul Fisher's code from Argon. Okay, so I, unfortunately I don't, uh, have time to talk about all the activities in SEED, I would encourage you to go on our website and, and get in touch with us if you're interested in, in uh, what's going on there. Uh, the only uh, thing I wanted to mention is the work we're doing on optimizing the kernels of the finite element computations um, for future architectures. Okay, we call these benchmarks, we call them bake-off problems because we have many people on SEED, different projects, and we are using them actually to compare and learn from each other, uh, including with the Howard community, actually. We'd, we'd like to get as many people involved in that, and, and, and this is beneficial to everyone that's involved. So if you have super high performance Howard code, please jump in. So these are the type of plots that we are looking at. Uh, we are fixing uh, the parallelism, in this case, 512 nodes, uh, and, we are, and we are plotting the points per node, so degrees of freedom per compute node, versus throughput, basically um, degrees of freedom per second. Uh, this, is, this, this particular problem, BP1, is just solving with a higher the mass matrix, okay? So the simplest possible thing you can think of. Okay, so since we have fixed the number of nodes, when you go to the left here, what happens is you're in the strong scaling regime, your problem per node is very small. And when you go to the right, you get the large problem. So this is where you get the full performance of the machine. This is where you're really, really strong scaled and you probably wanna, if you do strong scaling, you probably kinda wanna be in the middle here. You don't wanna get the full performance, but maybe you wanna use as many cores as possible, so maybe you have 50% of the performance, okay? And the different curves here correspond to different orders. So this is low order, this is second order, and going up. So these are the results with them. So one thing that is obvious here is that high order gives you much better performance. It gives you much better performance overall, and it gives you much better performance if you want a strong scale too. Uh, now, one of the success stories of this bake-off problems is that uh, uh, another finite element called DUAL2 that you may have heard of uh, also got in and they submitted some results that looked like this. And we were like, oh, interesting. Their results are higher than us. Why? And so one of the things we learned here is that they're using vectorization over the elements with explicit intrinsics. And when, when we put that in, in our code, we, we, we got much better results too. And so... This is an example where working with the community is really helpful, and it's, in fact, it's also fun. Okay, so this, our, this is kind of our best um, CPU results. 
Uh, now we also, of course, optimizing for GPUs. And so this is another of the benchmark problems, uh, benchmark round five, which corresponds to, to solve with a stiffness matrix where the degrees of freedom and the quality of points coincide, like in a spectral method. Uh, and these are some results with an OCA-based kernel uh, in SEED. I believe you've heard about OCA. So this allows us in particular to run, um, uh, to run on the GPUs. The, what, what you see here, the different curves actually correspond to different implementations of this kernel. Okay, and this, as you can see, for different orders, uh, different implementations win. You really have to explore the space. These kernels are relatively complicated. They're beyond what BLAS does. They're, be, they, you know, they're kind of combination of sparse and dense linear algebra operations. So, and, and also, different kernels with different orders win on different hardware. Uh, and so when you go to order 14, uh, you know, pretty much from, from one point on, it's, it's these, these blue guys up to a point, but not these 10 guys that, that start to tank here. Uh, if you make a similar plot by the number of grid points, as you can see, you, we get to about two teraflop. And so this is one GPU, it's twice ASCII red, um, with order 14. Okay, this is a Volta GPU. All right, and so let me just wrap up. Um, I think finite elements, and in particular harder finite elements, are really something uh, that, that, that will be useful for you to pay attention to. Uh, for future architectures. If you would like to learn more about uh, the things that I just briefly described, please go to our websites and uh, you can look at papers. Both MFM and CIDA are open source. Uh, but I've just really scratched the surface. There's so much interesting work uh, that has to be done in this area and, and it, I think it's a great area to start in. Uh, starting from porting to GPUs but also um, how do you extend this to simplices? We've, we've, I've only showed you things on tensor product elements where, where these tensor contractions are much more relative. How do you do preconditioning and how do you do any algebraic method if you don't have a matrix because that's what is efficient for your operator? Yes. So I have a question about um, the measurement of the results. So uh, you say that this includes all the AMR components and I was wondering because when you look at the results you have about half a million um, unknowns and um, that takes about 50 seconds on, on 64 cores. Uh, so <coughs> what's taking the most time of these, in these components? Is it the rebalancing that takes so much time? Uh, it's actually the, the RAP in the, uh, the P-transpose AP, which is done for hyper, for the assembly. Um, you should also keep in mind that this is on BGQ. And BGQ, by today's standard, that processor is very slow. Is the P transpose AP? I have the breakdown. I just don't have it in this talk. I have the breakdown and everything. Yeah, I'll, we have a paper on this actually. Okay. Yeah. So in your um, 2D short pipe problem benchmark, I think this is like 20. What is the reason? Why is the this one? No, the next 28. I'm just trying to understand why the. Well, I guess the difference in accuracy between the same model the uniform It's because you, you get a, a bit of an effect of H HP here. Um, you, get, you get a very thin elements next to the shock, and away from the shock, where the solution is smooth, you get basically higher P. Right? So, so for example, on a mesh like this, you, if, if you've already resolved the shock with your mesh, you just want to increase the order in the rest of the elements to capture the fact that, it's, that the solution is smooth there. And so this solution basically looks like it's, it's smooth, it goes up, it goes sharply down, and it's smooth again. Okay, so it's an effect, it's an HP effect, essentially. So if you draw HP refinement, it will look like this. And you don't have that with the unit But it's pretty close. And for the, you know, it, with HP, you have to make the decision to go HOP. There are many more complications there. It's not straightforward. So as you can see by this list of names, there's actually a, a large group of people. And these are basically just the leads of individual topic areas in most cases. But these are, or, well, if you will, they're the senior investigators 
on the FastMath project involved with unstructured meshing technologies. Up until now, in the MFEM presentation, you've heard about one of the activities in the unstructured mesh areas that, fa that FastMath is involved with. Um, I'm going to try to hit very quickly on others. So just to reiterate, why does FastMath have an activity on unstructured meshes? Well, we've heard some of the advantages of unstructured meshes. Uh, and in fact, unstructured meshes can be a variety of types. Thus far, you've only seen one category of them. You'll see some, some additional ones shortly. Um, the fact that with these methods, we can deal with complex geometries, do things in a much more automated sense, um, account for anisotropy, and really optimize, if you will, the uh, number, the, the accuracy per number of degrees of freedom, but at the disadvantages of much more complex data structures, more complex algorithms. So what the goal of the fast math activities and non-structured meshing techniques has been the, the development of tools and technologies that can be used by the developers of analysis capabilities, simulation capabilities, to integrate with their tools. In the case of MFEM, you see where it's, these technologies are being integrated into the entire analysis package. In many of the tools I'll be talking about, we're developing specific capabilities that are going to be integrated into other analysis packages. Right? So our goal is to provide these things typically as components, many of them operating through APIs of, of various categories, and we'll see a little bit more about the, the options on those, uh, those APIs actually at the end of today, uh, as well as to direct, uh, address specific technical gaps. So for example, uh, MFEM is addressing one, a critical gap of we really need to go to higher order methods to much more effectively use the next generation of machines. You're going to need to uh, buy, uh, work with a more complete analysis framework for doing that. You'll see that we are addressing other technical gaps in some of the things I will briefly touch on. And we work directly with DOE applications to foster the use of these. So what are the areas that we work on? We, there are unstructured uh, mesh analysis codes, MFEM being one of them. I'll mention two other ones. Performant mesh adaptation, the ability to adapt meshes on parallel computers. You've heard about the uh, refinement, derefinement techniques for tensor, that works well on tensor product types of meshes. I'll be mentioning the work that's being done to work on fully unstructured tetrahedral meshes or hybrid meshes uh, of various categories, but primarily tetrahedral meshes that's also being developed as part of fast math. Uh, when you do adaptive techniques, your load balance is going to change as well as actually other applications, and I'll touch on one of those. So we need to deal with dynamic load balancing and with these new architectures, much more effective management of the tasks. Where do we place the computational tasks and carry them out? I'll then mention three areas that are somewhat new to what we're doing in fast math on structured mesh applications. And one of those is to basically deal with a category of, of multi-scale analysis, and that is particle and cell methods coupled with unstructured meshes. Uh, the other two areas, unstructured meshes linked tightly with UQ operations on certainty quantification activities. Uh, UQ is one of the activities that we didn't mention much about, but in fact is a large activity within the fast math project on uncertainty quantification, um, and we're uh, linking with the investigators there. And then also building on some work that's been done in the past on in situ uh, visualization to really bring in data analytics and, if you will, computational steering for complex evolving domain problems, et cetera. Right, so the unstructured mesh analysis codes that are part of the fast math activities, uh, typically only partially supported through fast math, math, through fast math, supported by a number of other activities. You've heard about MFEM. 
Uh, there's also the Albany code, which is a fairly generic final element framework that builds on top of Trilineos components being applied to a number of applications. Uh, ice sheet modeling is one of the SIDAC applications, nonlinear solid mechanics, quantum device modeling, et cetera. A code called PASTA, which is uh, a more a narrower code. It is a Navier-Stokes flow code with a wide variety of turbulence models and techniques within that that's highly scalable for those types of applications. It's been uh, applied to a lot of aerodynamics codes as well as codes in uh, multi-physics on uh, DOE applications. Activities that are underway now on bringing unstructured mesh activities and coupling them with uncertainty quantification is to be able to do joint adaptivity and to really balance that joint adaptivity. So we'll do unstructured mesh adaptation in the physical domain as well as spectral uh, P type, of, basically P type of adaptivity in the stochastic spaces to be able to more effectively carry out the UQ operations. And that is being applied to problems where you've got geometric uh, uh, uncertainties and want to be able to account for those. And unstructured meshes are nice for when you have to deal with variable geometry. Some of the additional developments will be uh, you know, specific error estimators within that as well as uh, redu uh, reduction of uh, spaces. The in-situ uh, visualization and data analytics work is building on the fact that we've been quite successful on doing large problems, scaling problems of a, uh, basically 100 billion elements to, uh, uh, four or four, uh, to 3 million, excuse me, 3 million processes. Uh, and we're generating 10 terabytes of data section in, second in that. So we really would like to, as effectively as possible, guide those within situ so we're not saving all that data um, and to uh, carry that out. And that's already been done with some joint work with a variety of groups on the visualization side. We're now targeting more live reconfigurable activities such as seeing how the flow is evolving and saying, well, I can see that design isn't ideal. I really want to move uh, this, this, uh, these actuators to a different location in active flow control devices or other activities or to start doing your data analytics within that process. Right. So I'm, some of the other topics I'm going to cover now I will go into a little bit more depth. Um, and the, uh, one of the core tools that has been developed uh, is the parallel unstructured mesh infrastructure referred to as PUMI. Uh, and the concept there is to be able to think about dealing with totally unstructured meshes of any type. So these could be the example here at the bottom is a, a, a tetrahedral mesh. How do we support applications that want to work with these meshes on millions of processes and they're distributed? Uh, over them, so the mesh uh, is, is, uh, techniques support that. You can partition the mesh, you can modify the partitions, you can support the interprocessor communications, do various groupings within that. And then uh, that is combined with tools to be able to carry out the, uh, the processes of doing a complete simulation starting from the mesh generation. Now within FastMath, we're not writing mesh, the actual initial mesh generators. There are a variety of tools that can go automatically from CAD data to the meshes, such as the GMesh code, which is an open source code. Uh, we happen to work with a code, uh, some uh, commercial software from Symmetrix, uh, just because we're very familiar with it and it's quite powerful. Um, and we can t they can generate those meshes and in, and in uh, uh, those cases also generate the meshes in parallel. We can take them and then adapt them using a posteriori information, uh, accounting for the geometry as that is it is evolving, as well as anisotropy, and then apply methodologies to control the shapes of the elements. Uh, within that end, as shown in the, the bottom pictures there, doing this also on curved finite elements as needed for higher order methods. 
the mesh adaptation procedures being used here uh, are trying to do the, the, if you will, as much of a blend between methods that are strict refinement methods or, and or de-refinement methods, but methods that are flexible enough to do any type of geometric operation you want, accounting for geometry, as well as degrees of anisotropy that well beyond what you might want, can do with a, a well-structured a well refinement, de-refinement. So it's local mesh modifications, but still within the context that's as flexible as what you would get with a fully automatic mesh generation to begin with. Um, and I won't go into much more detail on that, but it, you carry out these combinations of operations and you can evolve meshes. So for example, this mesh here is a mesh somewhere along the way. It happens to be a hybrid mesh with the boundary layers within that. Uh, it is not a well-structured mesh for the particular calculation. The adaptive procedures adapt the boundary layer, adapt the surface meshes and volume meshes. And you can see a much more well-aligned uh, for this particular flow application. This has been applied to, these are applied to a variety of, of problems. These same techniques are, have been and continue to be extended to deal with curved finite elements uh, and being applied on harder problems uh, with specialized localized meshing procedures, et cetera. Right? Supporting within this is the fact that, of course, you don't have to, you don't just have the mesh as your data, but you have your fields that you're solving for as well as the attributes that were specified to begin with. So there's the ability to track these on these parallel meshes, operate on them with a tool called the, the uh, APF. Now very important within carrying out uh, any of these calculations is the ability to load balance. Um, so there are within FastMath a variety of activities developing dynamic load balancing capabilities. In particular, the Zoltan and Zoltan II libraries developed at Sandia National Labs, uh, primarily under the guidance of Karen Devine, uh, that provide, uh, have collected, if you will, multiple tools and then added to those for being able to do dynamic load balancing. balancing. EdgePAR is a specific tool for partition improvement to account for multiple criteria. Uh, if any interest in that, uh, in fact, uh, Cameron Smith, who will be speaking next, is the primary author of that. And then uh, ExtraPulp, which is a, a scalable graph partitioning procedure uh, of which that uh, is really oriented towards high performance and generic applications, which we're starting to evolve and apply uh, and make use of and going to hybrid systems. So Zoltan supports a variety of, of partitioners, both geometric partitioners uh, uh, as well as um, the topological uh, partitioners. So the typical geometric partitioners are recursive coordinate bisection uh, or inertial coordinate bisection, Nualti jagged, which Karen Devine developed, or the commonly applied space filling curves that are very nice on uh, 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 adapted AMR types of meshes where you're just uh, subdividing elements. Topologically based procedures um, have an advantage that they do a better job of controlling communications, but they're typically uh, slower uh, in terms of their operations and there's multiple tools in there. Uh, Parametus being probably the most common scotch also, and there's a, the hypergraph capabilities that can account for more connectivities within them. So pulp is a very a specific development and extra pulp uh, for being able to do these techniques on very high performance systems and is really oriented towards next, some of the next generation machines. So that we typically have been using these in adaptive analyses. So I'm going to give it a quick example now. And in fact, Cameron later on this afternoon will expand on this a little bit. I'm just going to motivate it by 
it's nice to have these tools, but when applications bring you a problem, sometimes you have to put things together in rather complex methodologies. Uh, so if you will, when we're doing an adaptive simulation, we're going to need to understand what is the load balance that's important in various parts of the calculation. So in a finite element calculation, what's important when forming the system, the system is different than what's important when solving it. And you may want to account for multiple criteria and how do you do all of that. As well as the fact that in reality, tools seem to have sweet spots. So for example, when we started getting to problems with a million parts, we found that the graph partitioners would break <laughs> or just sort of go away. They're running and running and running and sort of got hung up in their multi-levels or whatever. Um, so you, 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 we have these convolute, what look like fairly convoluted methodologies that have been developed say, well, if it's a big enough problem, you really need to do these types of things where we combine, it would turn out various combinations of graph partitioners being run globally and then locally, geometric partitioners run globally and also possibly locally, and then partition improvement methodologies that say, okay, because I did some stuff locally, I really have got to do some diffusive things to get it back to a good global solution, uh, and you have a fairly uh, complex problem that you then need to solve. Okay. Now, the, as mentioned, the, uh, the ground rules have changed in terms of the system, so now we've got to figure out how to do all these things and support stuff on the uh, accelerator-based systems. So in fact, some of the work that we've done in the past on, very, uh, on the multi-criteria partition improvement methods, we're trying to generalize to those to work with more regular types of graph structures as opposed to the very specialized mesh-based ones that we had for the two reasons of being able to take advantage of developments that are being done on graph, supporting graphs on GPUs, et cetera, as well as being able to do a different additional applications. And you'll see an example of that when we talk about the parallel mesh pick work. Okay, so let me skip that for, uh, well, this is just the fact that we can apply partition improvement to take methodologies that were with a standard graph partitioner. Uh, you would find that although it balances the elements perfectly, you get very large imbalance into your equation solved because the degrees of freedom are associated with different mesh entities. We can very quickly account for that because it's usually there's very small spikes that are created, and we can knock down those spikes pretty quickly with a diffusive method. Right. Mentioned that we're initiated activities to be able to deal with a class of multi-scale problems on unstructured meshes. So this is particle and cell methods. This slide just depicts the various steps in a particle and cell method in which there's a push operation in which the particles are going to be moving through the mesh based on the physics of the problem being solved. That is the very, if you will, the most dominant part of the process. And we would like to be able to work with unstructured meshes on with this um, where that part of the process does not need to be doing communication during that. We will need to do communication in other parts of it where we uh, have, need to relate now the fact that the particles have moved. We need to update the fields on the mesh based on the posi new positions of the particles. That is used basically to update the right-hand side of a linear system uh, in this particular application. We then need to solve the linear system in the finite element calculation and then basically reassociate information back to the particles based on that new field for the next push operation. Right? Now historically this was always done, uh, so historically this was done on implementations that made sense in that you said, well, you know, I'm doing these, these methods, I've got a trillion particles on a mesh of a million elements, ought to hell with it. I'm going to put a copy of the entire mesh on every memory space that I'm going to solve the problem on, and I'll distribute my particles. Well, as it turns out, in problems they want to be doing for ITER, 
and other applications, they really need to distribute the mesh also, as well as improve data locality uh, past what they've been seeing with the particle-based data structure. So we're looking at how can we distribute the mesh uh, as well as the particles. And what it boils down to is you have to eliminate your particle-only data structure. You can't have the particles driving something if you, uh, and have an unrelated distributed mesh. So we distribute the mesh and relate the particles to the through the mesh. Uh, that is, if I want to find out about particles, I got to go to the mesh to begin with. So in doing this, the components we need to be able to develop are an appropriate distributed mesh, the ability to do particle migration adjacency search because we're not going to want to be doing a global search on the background grid because we don't have a particle data structure anymore. Uh, and then we have to do the standard operations in a pick of doing the, the particle to, uh, to mesh uh, and field back to the particle. We're going to need to support dynamic load balancing and do the continuum solve. Uh, within this already, you know, we've got a factor of four improvement in the actual loca the location of what element a particle is in once it's moved, although more than half of that came from just realizing, always check the element you're in first because over half the time they don't move past that element. Right? So how do we deal with the distributed mesh? In a typical finite element calculation, you distribute your mesh and you just have you know, the mesh on a particular part and you just have the interface. That's what we would have in the typical PUMI application. Um, in some cases, people like to have a layer of ghost elements. Well, and what we're going to do and what we're calling PUMI pick is want a set of layers that's substantially larger than that being dictated by the fact that in a single push operation, I don't want something going off part. So we have this more complex data structure for that. We're developing new methods for dynamic load balancing within that. Uh, without going into detail, we're, we, you, you have these copies of these meshes on what, that we're calling a pick part on multiple processes with large overlap within them, but still it's distributed, so it is now scalable. But now you have to, when particles move, you have to decide for load balancing when I have to move them because they're not in what we call the safe zone or when I want to move them to gain load balance and there's procedures being developed for that building on top of the dynamic load balancing technologies. So for a particular application, how we actually want to distribute the mesh might be very different. So for this gyrokinetics code XGC, it's a field following mesh that we've developed the tools for uh, making the meshes on, but now w because of that we have to have partitions that are very unusual relative to what you want for your finite element solve with these large overlaps, and then we have to coordinate that with a finite element solve on it in a way, way that we don't strongly introduce additional communications within that process. So it gets pretty messy, right? So in, the, uh, in a, uh, another uh, activity that's been ongoing for a while is using these tools to build parallel simulations using in-memory technologies. Often when we're working with an application, they already have their finite element code or their finite volume code or whatever. They want our parallel mesh. But the first requirement they say is don't touch our analysis code. So we say, OK, we'll do that. And we'll just interact through your file structures. And then they're real happy for about six weeks after we do that until they realize that they're spending more time changing files between the mesh adaptation procedures and the analysis code than they're doing spending in either of the codes. So we tell them, well, if you won't let us in, we'll do some in-memory integration, but we'll do it in specific ways. And Cameron Smith this afternoon will actually explain this in more detail. But we've actually come up with methodologies where we do very minimal modifications to their analysis code using data streams to load the data structures at, this, at a cost of some extra data. 
uh, and or using APIs. So with this, we can create in-memory adaptive loops for a variety of applications. I'm not going to explain that in detail because Cameron needs some time to talk about it, uh, do the hands-on. But these are some of the codes we've interacted with. So you've already uh, heard about MFEM with the, their internal structures. We also have linked PUMI into that so we can do the tetrahedral mesh applications. And you're going to see one of the applications that we're applying that to. And you'll see why we want to be able to work with that application in just a moment. Uh, PASTA, FUN3D is actually a finite volume code that NASA uses very heavily. Proteus is a finite element code. That's another uh, DOD code. Albany, ACE3P is electromagnetics code. Uh, M3DC1 is a extended MHD code, and Nectar is a, another code. So this is just an example of an application of electromagnetics using these adaptive meshes on second-order curved elements. This is the, an Albany application using the adaptive methods for ice sheet modeling. And this is one that we're working on jointly with uh, the MFEM code capabilities of where we're bringing our tools in to be able to couple all the way back to the ge from the geometry, which is a combination of CAD geometry and physics geometry to be able to bring in the geometry, defeature the geometry, combine the geometry together to create complex meshes on very nasty problems. So this is not something where we're going to be able to do a mesh generation on four command lines. In fact, it, you know, we've, we're, the, 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 the model that's being worked on now is a combination of 30 CAD models, uh, a, an EFIT surface, and a mesh from a, an, an interior uh, co analysis code. So within this, of course, we've integrated. Well, we uh, the analysis is going to be done within MFEM. We're using Pumi technologies to transition the mesh within that, and some specific tools to be able to generate to take meshes that could be straight sided to begin with and curve them. Could be curved sided, but we need to elevate the curve capabilities within that, and eventually to do the dynamic load balancing. So in this, this workflow, the models are first uh, defeatured in a, in a tool that comes from Symmetrics in our particular case. And we can very quickly defeature the model, then combine the RF antenna models with a CAD model of the overall reactor system with uh, created surfaces for that are come from electro or from a magnetics calculation of the flux surfaces along with an interior surface that comes from the analysis that was already done of the interior plasma to be able to generate models and meshes that look like that on the right hand side of which you can see that that's not something you want to at least I don't think I'd want to try to create a hex mesh for myself um, but and, and you know they, once that model has been generated, that mesh is actually generated with the press, basically a press of a button because the only mesh controls that were set were curvature-based refinement, which the mesh generator figures out all by itself. Okay, so Cameron, you would like to take over for the hands-on. All right. So from the agenda, you can find uh, this page linked, and this is mostly evening hands-on. But we're going to do a bit of you know, the first couple steps and preview uh, the evening. Uh, you all have multiple choices, so we're you know, trying to pitch it, I guess. Um, so this is an adaptive MFEM and PUMI workflow. It's going to combine a, you know, a handful of tools from the FastMath sort of catalog uh, and explore what it takes to process a complex geometric model, mesh it, partition it, and get into the uh, adaptive analysis and um, you know, ask you some softball-like questions to yeah, tease out some information and such. So again, we have an answers form here, uh, Google form, and yeah, you can fill in your answers as you proceed if I have no work. Um, and yeah, it's all on Cooley again. Uh, all the outputs are available if you, you know, wanna skip a step or just you know, wanna look ahead or so on. 
Uh, or they should be answering <laughs> questions now or in the evening. Uh, there is one question uh, to answer in this first part, just on mesh generation. Um, so it's a standard setup. If you've already done the R sync of the parent directory, this hands-on level, hands-on lessons directory, you don't need to do that again. Otherwise, you know, a lot of extra stuff. Um, but you do need to do this uh, to change your uh, soft keys to have Ember pitch. Uh, that's what was used to build the stack. Um, so yeah, as Mark showed, uh, we have this you know, extremely complex uh, model of this antenna. Uh, device. It's got bolts. It's got you know you know holes. It has brackets uh, and, and so on that we really don't need for the simulation. So how do we get from you know the geometry on the left to the geometry on the right? So you could find your your expert uh, in the the CAD software tools and you know painstakingly go through and edit it that way. Uh, but with the uh, Symmetrics software, uh, there's a sort of hot, uh, a simplified interface to do some of this defeaturing work um, that doesn't require that you're an expert in the particular uh, Granite or Pro-E or, or uh, NX or SolidWorks. Um, so to, to demonstrate this in, in, a, in a much simpler way, we have this uh, suspension upright geometry. Uh, it's got some complexities to it. There's, you know, the the folks uh, at RPI who designed this for the Formula Hybrid team, uh, you know, added some small faces in here on on this uh, main assembly, and then this this sort of bearing ring in the center. Um, we don't necessarily want that for the analysis, so uh, we'll go through and remove those. So when it's done, we'll have this model, um, and then we'll uh, run the mesh generator on it. Um, so I'm going to transition into a VNC running on our systems. This, I've tested this on the Cooley VNC. It's, it's, only, it's a very basic tiling window manager, so it doesn't look as pretty as this. Um, but the GUI is there, and it's functional. Um, so, so this is the, uh, the sim modeler uh, GUI. It's built using a set of C++ APIs, which are accessible and will demonstrate in the subsequent uh, mesh generation step. Um, so most of the things here that, that we'll see uh, can be run uh, sort of programmatically, which is a pretty powerful capability, especially when uh, you're trying to sort of make a, a robust and, and sort of, uh, automated workflow. Uh, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll flat, uh, blast through this. So just quickly, um, and again, you can do this in the evening. Um, we're going to get rid of some of these small faces here. And we can get rid of this ring, too. Yeah, not that one. That will skip the ring. Um, then we just click this little Add button. It adds the faces. We have it set to extend surfaces. You can also remove holes. Uh, and then we'll just apply, and they go away. Yeah, easy peasy. All right. Um, so obviously you do that many, many, many more times for the antenna model. Uh, so now mesh generation, the other, the other bit that this interface will do for you for uh, complex models. Uh, you define your mesh controls based on geometric model features or uh, subdomains of the ge geometric model. So you can define uh, you know, sim simple uh, primitive geometric primitives define refinement or size controls in them, or you can just click a face and set, you know, I want it refined on this face. Um, so the sizes I have set, uh, preset, which you know, aren't so visible, are there. And again, they're not, uh, you know, I didn't have to draw, you know, specific edges and vertices to generate these meshes. I just defined it on the geomet geometric model. And there's, there's a mesh. Uh, so again, this is all going to be accessible in the evening as well. Um, so we'll jump to Cooley, and we can quickly uh, run the mesh generation. So I'm skipping over problem definition at the moment, uh, but I'll tease it a bit in the sense that all of our simulations are defined from, at, at the, from the, top, the highest level possible. So when we're specifying boundary conditions, we're prescribing them on the on geometric model faces, edges, and, and regions. If you know you have some sort of uh, body force, 
um, and not on the mesh. And we'll see that in the evening section. Uh, so mesh generation, uh, we're basically just going to jump in. If you already have a node allocated, uh, and this is going to produce the same exact mesh that we saw in the um, in the GUI. There, this is the five K linear mesh, and that's it. It's done. Uh, and then there's in that same directory, there's a defeatured model with the ring and all those small faces removed, and it just generated that mesh. So you know the the softball question here is, you know, if you defeature the model, which which, if you have the same size controls, which mesh is going to be larger, right? And if you read some of this text that talks about what constraints the mesh generator runs under, uh, you can answer that question. So um, I'll stop it there with a preview, you know, a little bit more preview for tonight. We have uh, a partitioning exercise that follows, uh, which looks at geometric and graph partitioners, compares them, you know, qualities uh, in, in terms of imbalances and cuts. Uh, and then we'll uh, you know, talk more about the problem definition, how that's specified, what makes it possible to do that, and then we'll run an adaptive analysis that combines uh, MFEM and PUMI uh, and follow up with some questions on that. So, and of course, we have a long list of references at the bottom because everyone needs references. <laughs>